Let's start with a bit of an overview of the WSET Diploma Exam on Sparkling Wines. What can students expect? On the exam, you can expect three sparkling wines. Best case scenario for me would be something like a true champagne that's brute in that range or uh, extra brute, Prosecco or something that is really floral, Moscato d'Asti, and then uh, sparkling Shiraz. <laughs> <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> because the sparkling Shiraz, and I got one on my oh the sparkling wine exam. I was like, okay, it's either Lambrusco or it's sparkling Shiraz. Bingo! So oh. one down. Uh, and you'd hope that the other two white wines are going to be really different. Maybe one is going to be more floral and more youthful, and one will be more oxidative or autolytic, hopefully. Not going to always be that way, though. Um, but what to expect in the exam, expect everything and anything and be sure to rely and go back to your D1 tasting notes so that you understand how wine is made and really hone in on how sparkling wine is made in your D4 prep work. Mm -hmm. Know the differences between tank and uh, method traditionnel and know which wines are made that way and know why they're made that way know which ones have uh higher permitted yields which ones have lower permitted yields because that can be an indicator not an answer but an indicator to the concentration and intensity that you might get in the glass if it's a white wine not so much a sparkling red wine um but expect ex don't expect anything expect to be challenged yeah okay well it's said that the hardest part of the module like any of the diploma modules i guess is the huge amount of content you need to remember about the different sparkling wine styles so what are your best study tips for learning and remembering this content so d4 much like d5 is taught over a two-day period and one of the best ways to learn this information is to read all of the information prior to the first day of class. I did that for D4 and I felt a lot more comfortable in the D4 class. I did not do my reading before D5 because I had all this other stuff going on and I was like, mm, I know fortified wines, I'll totally catch up. <laughs> you don't. It is again like trying to take sips of water from a gushing fire hose that's coming right at your face. <laughs> so with D4 as with D5, but since we're talking about D4, read every last sentence of the diploma material before day one. Read it at least a week before class, if you can. You don't have to start taking notes. Maybe you start writing flashcards. Maybe you highlight the information if you printed it out or if you're on an iPad and you can highlight it in that format. But be sure to get all of the reading done because when you're in class, the instructor expects you to know what they're talking about when they're saying, oh, Crema tells us this or Zect that. Mm -hmm. And when you're going and you don't know what's going on, you're you're already 10 steps behind everybody else who's done the reading yeah. and then you have to catch up and you it's not like you can read it all the, that night and before day two because it's a vast amount of information yeah. and material and you can't read it all in one day yeah thinking you can catch up for day two so my advice read all the information at least a week prior to the classes go to class take great notes and then after the second day of your lecture, you have five, maybe six weeks before your exam. Mm. Go through your notes and just start studying. What I do, I study a region. I don't study all of France mixed up all together. Yeah. This is how champagne's made. This is what I have to do for Alsace. This is what I have to do for uh, Limoux or any other non, you know, cremants or uh, non top cremants. Same thing with Italy. I study Prosecco and then I study Franciacorta and then I study Lambrusco 
and mm -hmm. you have I did it by pockets mm -hmm. and truthfully if you study something smaller like Lambrusco or Cremant d'Alsace and get that down you certainly walk into the bigger appellations like Franciacorta, Prosecco and Champagne with a bit more confidence because you're like I kind of know how this stuff is made so now I can tackle the bigger stuff yeah. but knowing doing all of your reading prior to class is tantamount yeah and if you could take it further and you know do study notes and make flashcards or you know use brainscapes pre-made flashcards before class too you can sit back and listen and actually engage and ask questions in the lecture as opposed to desperately scribbling notes because you're so unfamiliar with everything they're saying yeah absolutely studying if, if you can mm -hmm. Yeah. Either study Brainscape's flashcards or create your own mm -hmm. and study those a little bit prior to class. You'll certainly be in a better position. Yeah. And one of the points I wanted to check in here was how important it is to, even though you progress through the, the material in a linear fashion, studying one region after the next, is to constantly come back to previous material you've covered and just to refresh it. And because you can know something so well you know in the first week and by end of week five right before the exam you're like it's gone everything oh. that you knew so well just out the you know out of your yeah. so and make for you that's one thing that i have learned that works really well for me with brainscape is that i tackle a smaller region creme d'alsace or lambrusco let's say mm -hmm. i get those flashcards down i get to about 75 mastery and then i reset my confidences Oh, nice. Yeah. And I do not let them hang out in the greens and the blues. <laughs> and then I go, okay, I'm going to go learn about Prosecco now. Mm. And then when I start learning about Prosecco, once I start getting the hang of Prosecco or I've gotten through half of the cards, I go back to that Cremant d'Alsace or Lambrusco deck and I run yeah. through them yeah. and I see what I remember. And the ones that I don't, I give myself a one and I, it, so it pops up and pops up and pops up again. Yeah. And then once I'm back to the 75, at least mastery on that Lambrusco or Cremant d'Alsace, reset the confidences and go back to my Prosecco. Yeah. And this yeah. can all be within an hour, actually, mm -hmm. because once you get that mastery down, you are you are flipping those flashcards and going to five super fast, super fast. And then you can put that away. And then I give myself a few more days and maybe I learned, went through all of Prosecco and then I went on to Champagne. And then I make sure I go back to those flashcards, to those Lambrusco flashcards, and I bust through them. Yeah. That way, if I'm asked about Lambrusco, which you can be, what are the differences between Rasparosa and whatever else? And do you have to know? Yeah. You have to yeah. know the differences in the grapes and their color richness and which adds more tannin and which adds more color and where they're grown. Yeah. Yeah. All right. What mistakes do students tend to make when studying for this exam? I think some of the mistakes that some students make before this exam is not looking at maps and knowing where these regions are, mm -hmm. but also memorizing facts without putting them into context. Uh, another thing also is focusing too much on the larger wine regions mm -hmm. like Champagne, Prosecco, Franciacorta, and then they forget about Zect, or they forget about Australian Shiraz or sparkling wine from South Africa, Africa. <laughs> from South Africa. Um, you have to know all those things because they are uh, they're important parts of the the economy of sparkling wine so study with maps don't think don't learn things in a vacuum understand everything that surrounds that particular region and why those wines are made a certain way and why those grapes are used in those sparkling wines. And uh, yeah, being prepared for the questions on on MCC and Zect. Yeah, right, and MCC. Esoteric regions. <laughs> All right, so now I'd love for you to walk us through an example of a, a question students might expect to see on the written portion of the exam and your thought process as you answer it. 
So one thing that I took away from my D4 exam was, oh, I really need to be able to define certain terms. Mm. Like if I were to say vintage champagne, a lot of people would go, oh yeah, it's from a, it's from a vintage. Well, what, why would they make it from that vintage? What makes it important? What makes it cool? What makes it relevant? Why do they do that? Mm -hmm. And you have to be able to go beyond, well, it's wine from a particular vintage. Well, why do they do that? Mm -hmm. Petit cuvee. And those are two terms that were on my exam. Define these terms. And it tells you the point worth. So if it says three points or five points or only one point, you get an indication. You can get a feel of how much information they want. If they want, if, if, the, if the value of that question is only one point, you can say like one or two sentences. If it's a five or three point question, you have to put down at least three or five or maybe six relative points so that you can tick those off. Right. With the diploma I have found and what I've learned is that you can speak a lot on something within this, the, the sphere of that question Right. Don't really go beyond it because then you you don't get points for the stuff out here. You and you you, you aren't marked off for the stuff that's out here. You want to keep your information right in here. Yeah. And you want to be able to show that you can jockey around, know that information, understand its context for that particular wine. Mm -hmm. And you just want to spit out as much as inf information as you can on that particular definition that you can think of mm -hmm. to, to earn as many points as possible. While being hyper relevant to the examiner's question. It's like Absolutely. A answer the effing question. That's all you have to do. Yeah. Don't answer the stuff that they're not asking. Yeah. Answer the question. Right. Look at the command verb. If they say define, define it. Mm -hmm. Don't explain it. Don't right. compare it define it. Awesome. All right. Well, now let's turn our attention to the practical component of D4. Uh, tell me about your experience in the exam room and uh, you know how you did. <laughs> well, it was, it was during COVID. It was the first October during COVID. So it was really challenging actually. Um, uh, but um, it was, I would say it was the most unique experience I've had as far as diploma exam test taking. Three wines, I told you about them at the top. One of them was sparkling Shiraz. One of them, I could not figure out what it was. And I kept erasing and rewriting and it was just very blurry. So I had to write really hard to, for my final oh. answer, but it was oxidized and it had residual sugar. And I was like, this is either an aged Riesling, maybe Zect, I'm not sure. Maybe it's an extra dry could be Chenin Blanc because the acidity was high, mm. bubbles were softer. So I thought an indication of age maybe. And, but it was, it certainly felt, it was, it was traditional method for sure. It was not some oxidized crappy right, yeah. echo. Um, but I couldn't figure out what it was. I ended up going with Chenin because I felt it was just bruised apple and lanolin and Bees waxy and just felt oxidized. Now I was like, well, Shannon oxidizes well. I was like, so does Riesling. But with the Zect, I was like, could be other varietals too. So I felt most comfortable with Shannon. I stuck with Shannon. Yeah. And it turned out to be the aged Zect. But I was yeah. like, you know what? <laughs> What's great about the WSET exams is that you can get the wine totally wrong. Yeah but you can still pass that portion because you did a great, a great job of explaining what it was, what your tasting grid was mm -hmm. and how you got to that conclusion. Yeah. Okay, cool. And I was, it, you might've told me the story a while ago where you were in a, in the examining room and you noticed as they were pouring the wine that there was this frothy explosion. Was that you? Okay. And that you knew just from seeing them pour the wine that it was very likely a Prosecco. Yes. So Prosecco, the way that it bubbles up in the, in the glass is very different and how it settles is very different. How it settles in the glass, it has that frothy yeah. internals that the, the circumference or the perimeter 
yeah. is always going to stay frothy and it won't quite have that beautiful, elegant perlage, mm. that consistent perlage that true champagne does. Champagne does not have that frothy mm. ring around the inside of the glass. So pro tip, watch them pour the wines. Yes. Yeah. Because if it does that, it's going to be Prosecco or Moscato d'Asti, something like that. It won't be a true champagne or traditional method sparkling wine. Right. Awesome. All right. Well, tell me, how do you approach taking down your tasting notes? Any hacks or tips? What a great question. You know, I asked this question in one of my diploma classes and I never got a good answer. So <laughs> I found a method that worked for me. And I think that also people are, uh, might be a little protective of how they take notes, but I'll tell you how I take my tasting notes. I memorize the SAT and I write it down in the margin and it's appearance, nose, palate. Mm -hmm. So I write those in and then it's acidity, tannin, alcohol, body, flavor characteristics, flavor, uh, intensity, finish and other. Wow. Did I put tannins in there? I think I did tannins are between acidity and I haven't done it in a while. I haven't sat for a test in a couple of weeks, sorry. But I do that, I memorize it and I always go over it. Mm. And whenever you're talking about sparkling wine, you have to put in the, the, the quality of the mousse. Is it frothy? Is it silky? How well knit or loose are the bubbles? And that does help you categorize the sparkling wine. I write that down and I have my own method of whether it's M for medium or minus or plus. And there are moments where I think it's medium plus slash high acidity. And I'll put that on my grid. Taste them as taste them when they're first poured, taste them when they're cold, mm. get down that structure because it will change once they turn warm. Yeah. Do not finish your tasting grid or your SAT all at once. And don't conclude it all at once. Taste it. Get the get the appearance nose palette down, walk away from it, go do your definitions, go do an essay, come back, taste them when they're a little bit warmer because they will usually almost always be so much more expressive. Yeah. And then you can go, oh, that is Shannon because I'm getting a more woolly linoleum note. Mm. Or, oh, that does smell more diesel flinty. I think that could be a Riesling. Or, wow, that's a lot more autolytic than I thought but it doesn't quite have the concentration of champagne. Maybe it's cava, an aged cava, reserva or grand reserva. So tasting it when it's warm, tasting them when they're warm is so important. Mm -hmm. And then I go back to my tasting grid, taste it again. Am I getting the same things? Double check, double check. And PS, I do my little tasting grid. I make myself a little uh, box, do my shorthand, and then I long write it out because I don't know what the examiners want because I asked that question once in class and I never got an answer. So I was like, I'm just going to show you how I'm thinking and then tell you what wow. I'm, tell you what I'm de definitely think that what yeah. the structural calls are. Yeah. And keeping in mind that no matter if it's D4, D5, or D3, if you write a lot of descriptors because you keep getting so many, it's it probably is going to be at least a very good, maybe outstanding wine and the quality is going to be high. Yeah. But don't just write down notes because you keep getting things or you think they want to know they, you think they want to know how much, you know, right. Really objectively taste the wine. And if it is a simple wine, say that it's simple. Mm. And if you're going to say that don't have 10 descriptors, have three, have five. Yeah. And the acidity most likely is not going to be like screaming high or the balance won't be perfectly in balance. Like be open to looking for the flaws in the wine. Does it smell, is, 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 is it some, um, is its length not very long? Mm -hmm. Is it only a medium finish or is it a short finish? If it's one of those, it's not going to be an outstanding wine. Mm -hmm. And if, a, if you write down all of these descriptors and you got green apple and crisp yellow apple and, and 
fleshy white pear and it smells like mountain flowers and you get all these other you get endive and thyme and it's and you get all this river rock and and then you go this is a simple wine and it's good <laughs> it not, and it does not make sense so make sure that your tasting note reflects your quality assessment yeah and vice versa okay that's some great intel um and i love that you mentioned the nose of the sparkling wine um it can be enough to give you an ID on a wine, just the nose, uh, which would be in a dream scenario in the exam room. But do you have any hard and fast pointers for aromas, like definitive aromas to look out for and what wines they might indicate? Great question. So something that is autolytic and lazy, cheesy, brioche will indicate a longer aging process early. Yeah. What are those wines that do that? The first ones that come to my mind are champagne and cava. And a lot of people will forget about cava or they'll forget about Cremant d'Alsace or um, you, you might actually forget about Zecht. You might forget, oh yeah, they can actually use Pinot Noir in Zecht. It doesn't have to be all Riesling all the time. Mm. The Pinot family is allowed. Mm -hmm. And they actually do make Vinzer Zects and you can be tested on a vintage Zect like I was. And then you're <laughs> like, I did. but honestly, who tastes those wines all the time? I don't, I certainly don't. And I'm in New York and I'm in one of the top wine markets in the world. I rarely see aged vintage Zect. Wow. So I didn't know what it should taste like. And I'm a seasoned professional. Mm -hmm. But you don't see it. But also the trends right now in sparkling wine is to drink it. Uh, if it's if it's aged, it's usually vintage champagne. It's not going to be vintage Zect. Mm -hmm. uh, but also there's a lot of uh, Brut Nature and uh, extra Brut bone dry wines right now are leading the force. Mm -hmm. And they're not, those don't necessarily age very well or not all of them age very well. They just become like these skinny heroin chic models where you're like, wow, you look really old. <laughs> and you're skinny and you've got no fat on your bones. Yeah. And you need that for a wine to age. You need structure. And just because you have ripping acidity doesn't mean that you're gonna age well. Yeah. Or a heroin chic body doesn't mean you're gonna age well. <laughs> As we so, see, yeah. So uh, it's it's it, they, they can test you on anything. So you just have to be prepared for anything. But what's great about wine people is that we're curious people. So when you do see an aged method cap classique and it's 25 bucks, you might go, might be past its prime, but you know what? I should probably try that. Yeah. And then I can write that off my taxes. <laughs> Professional development, that's yeah. what I do. <laughs> Bro, Jim, buy all your wine and, and run it off your taxes as professional development. <laughs> Good to know. I wonder if I can as well. <laughs> well, what are the so what are what are some of the other sort of signature noses that you get from sparkling wines? Right. So autolytic notes, uh, wines that have uh, that were acerly, uh, more diesely high high notes of. Uh, citrus and maybe gunflint would lead me towards a zect mm -hmm. uh again the lanolin lan again <laughs> the lanolin or wet wool note and uh a, a really like like applesauce note i get for shannon blanc mm -hmm. lambrusco and when if you're trying to taste the, the difference between lambrusco and sparkling Shiraz. Sparkling Shiraz usually has higher alcohol, so you'll be able to feel it mm -hmm. in the weight. Uh, both can have tannin, but sparkling Shiraz just has, just has this uh, a sunny, richer, denser quality to it than yeah. Lambrusco does. And Lambrusco usually will have a bit more tannin, will not have any new wood. Sparkling Shiraz can have new wood on it. Yeah. So those are some goalposts that I look for, but keeping your mind open because when, when you, 
usually your first instinct is right, but don't be afraid, don't second guess yourself, but don't be afraid to explore other options. So if you're like, oh, it's autolytic, it's champagne. Might not be champagne, mm -hmm. might be kava. Yeah, great. Well, okay, so final question. You're the lead author of Brainscape's flashcards for the WSCT diploma module on sparkling wine. Can you tell us a little bit about how you made these flashcards and why they're a really useful supplementary study tool? One of the greatest things about Brainscape is the algorithm and how it understands. It learns how you learn. So when you give yourself a one or a two, it will repeat it more frequently. And that helps me with my learning. Everyone learns differently. But how I learned the best was dumping all of this information into Brainscape so that I could study off of it. I studied off of my own flashcards for the Brainscape exam, for Brainscape cards for my D4 exam. Okay. And it, it, it was incredibly helpful. When I first started the diploma, D1, was uh brainscape was not around uh it was 2016 i believe or at least i didn't know about brainscape yeah. and i hand wrote all my flashcards it was about 450 of them or so for d1 once i fast forward a few years i took a few years off from the diploma fast forward and then there's brainscape and i learned about about, about brainscape i want to say in 20 i think it was the same year but it was after my exam mm. And then I was like, oh, this app does what I want my flashcards to do. Hmm. And once it, it's a lot, you front load all that, all that work because you have to put in so much work into the cards. But once you have the cards, it's yeah. a breeze. You just flip through the cards and you can reset your confidences. Then if you don't want to see a card anymore, you're like five, five, five. And then if you want to mix it up and mix across your decks, you can do that. And which is what I always wanted my flashcards to be able to do, but they were paper and I couldn't do it, you know, except if I wanted to shuffle. Mm -hmm. And then I'd be like, oh, I don't know where to put that card because I did, I either know it too well or I don't know it well enough. Yeah. Um, but studying for the exam is, it, it's, it's so much. You have to taste a lot also. So be ready to invest, to go to your local wine merchant and say, I want a mixed case. And I want this, 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 this. Taste every sparkling wine that you can when you go out uh, to restaurants or bars or whatever. Even if it's just ask for a taste. If you want to have a cocktail th that night and you don't want to do wine, just ask for a taste. Mm. And get your mind around it. Get that first taste down and do a quick SAT. Is this autolytic? Is it fruity? Where's the acidity? What are, What's the bubble texture like? Is it well knit? Is it loose? Is it um what's the body like is it is it higher body is it or a fuller body is it a lighter body um keeping in mind though that most sparkling wines are going to be in that 11 and a half to 12 and a half range so everything's going to be either everything's going to be probably medium body or light body mm. except for your sparkling shiraz uh but where's the is there residual sugar on it what's the what are what are the what are the clusters of fruits that i'm getting on it is it more tropical is it more orchard is it more uh citrus and what's their intensity is it or is it not intense and what's the finish like all that from a tiny sip of sparkling wine before you get something else or maybe you get a full glass of it but being able to quickly do an sat when you get something will help immensely and doing your practice mock exam questions, yeah. finding study buddy, creating your own mock exams, paying attention to what the examiners give you feedback on. And again, as sometimes cagey as the examiner's reports can be, learn what your guidelines are. What, learn from other people's mistakes. What yeah. were the mistakes that people made on the last exam? Okay, that's what I should not do and keep it right here. Yeah, so practice you know, the practical component, the tasting, practice the questions themselves and just practice the content using Brainscape. <laughs> using Brainscape. Brainscape will help a lot. It really does. Yeah. And I've heard that actually from my study buddy for D3 just took her D5 uh, exam the other day. Hmm. And 
she and I learn similarly, but not the same way. No one learns the same way. Yeah. But she said to me, I finally figured out how to make Brainscape work for me. And I'm forgetting what she said, but I shared with her, I reset my confidences. And she was like, oh, I'm gonna try that. And it worked for her. And she found that studying across the decks, right. learning basic stuff, instead of focusing on one region yeah. like I did, she found that learning a little bit of something for across the decks worked best for her. And then she felt that she could dive into each one yeah. uh, separately, instead of just focusing on one and learning one and then moving on. Yeah. But figuring out how Brainscape works for you is, is will only launch you to the top of your best possible examining self. Yeah. If that I, made sense and not like yeah. a doctor kind of way. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's more about sort of the order in which you attack the content. Um, Cause you know, the Brainscape algorithm is very much personalized to the individual learner. And so, you know, it works the same across the board, but it's, it's, it is like, do you work better with the nitty gritty first or do you like a mix, a total study mix or, and it is just playing around with the tool and, and, until it, you know, you hack yeah. it. Yeah. Well, there you have it. The best advice for taking on the WSET diploma module on sparkling wine straight from the expert's mouth. Now also be sure to check out Brainscape's mobile and web flashcards for this module, a powerful supplementary study tool to use alongside your official WSET learning materials. This expert curated collection distills down the latest curriculum on sparkling wines into 13 decks of 682 bite-sized facts, which you can then use to draw yourself on using Brainscape's sophisticated space repetition algorithm. In fact, Brainscape has proven to help you learn twice as efficiently as traditional study methods, which is a major step up when you consider the mountain of content you need to understand and memorize. So take Sarah's advice, study hard, get Brainscape in your corner, and you'll have what it takes to rise to the challenge of the WSET Diploma.